Okay, I, I, I suggest, I think we should start. Um, let me, uh, let me, for, uh, in today we'll discuss um, the uh, project part of the class, and then I will introduce the uh, topic for next week, which is sports informatics. All right, so some of the students asked me about the uh, the last part of this class where you need to do a final project. So I, I thought I'd start off by going through that and Gregor will help us by describing a little the uh, markdown format, which is how the final report has to be written. Okay, well, we've done that. So this final project, um, I'm not quite certain how many homeworks and lessons we have, but it'll be somewhere between 40 and 50% of the grade, probably 40%. Um, and the, the project will always have a report, and it's either a report plus software or just a report. Undergraduates can choose to do either software or report without, without penalty. Graduate students need to do a software component to get a full grade. You can get an A minus with a, without a software. The software needs to be runnable from the GitHub repository and all reports are deposited in the GitHub repository. Now here's something quite useful. They have here 100 previous projects. Currently 45 of them come from um, an earlier version of this class. And we will add a few, we will add more to this, but this is what we have at the moment. Uh, let me uh, let me go here. But this is still on the same shape. All right, so this is the um, table of contents for the second of those reports, which is from a 2017 version of this class. And you can see, I just thought you should, you could browse the, um, the topics that students chose. Here's a set of commercial projects like e-commerce, uh, uh, self, uh, predicting self safe drivers for insurance companies, um, travel industry, stock market, housing prices, real estate, Bitcoin, banking. Then we have some uh, set which are more technology oriented, involving Raspberry Pis. Um, this one, number 14 and uh, 16. Uh, here we have uh, processing weather data on the edge, and then we have the uh, near the sensors which are detecting the weather, education, environment, a lot on health. I will have a whole section on health, so later on. And something and lifestyle, which means more consumer oriented things such as uh, food, food informatics. Right, so you can browse that, um, this collection and see, get some idea of what's, uh, what people did in the past. All right, so that's this um, uh, link here, this middle link. So the other links come from different classes. Gregor and I have taught, which have a stronger technology component, cloud computing or using the big data software stack. And so they, they might have a slightly less application orientation. 
and you can work in a team from one, from an individual through three people and obviously if you have a team you need to do more work and say the reports uh, because, so that we can actually keep track of them and things we like them to be uh, organized around github and also Using GitHub is a useful skill to have because essentially all open source software these days is done in GitHub. And things like Colab, that, is, uh, that uses the Markdown format, which is the GitHub text format. So using Markdown and GitHub is a useful skill which allows you to use Jupyter Notebooks and, and participate in open source software. Uh, I found here, uh, uh, an app that uh, a free app that converts Google Docs to Markdown format, and the total project report size uh, is um, for some up maybe three thousand words. If it's a pure paper, then you should have four thousand words, and if you're a team, if you have teams, you need to add more information. One of the things you'll have to do is to um, browse the available data sets. So the homework this week, which I haven't quite set up yet, will involve you just planning this project. It will not, and maybe writing a short summary of those plans. It will not involve doing the project, just starting to plan it. It will not even involve making a final decision because that you don't have to do that quite yet. But it's good to get started early on uh, thinking about these projects. And here is uh, the we will set up a, a description of the of the formatting and everything and this is and if this is some there will be some straightforward format and we would prefer we would like you to use a qual a standard references to papers using a using standard agreed formats and I think that's it. All right, so are there any questions on that? No questions? If there are no questions, maybe Gregor, you could start describing Markdown for people. Yeah, here's uh, Gregor. If you can't hear me, uh, let oh, me you're know. You're wonderful. And um, I'm trying now to identify how to share the screen. Uh, it's not difficult. Uh, OK. Um, so you see my screen. Um, and I have uh, gone conveniently to our GitHub repository for this class. And for other things, as you know, you can find your name while typing in here on the find your name. Maybe I type in um, this name here and you get to this particular repository. <clears throat> and um, now you want to go ahead and add your document to this repository. Um, there is a convenient button here that says add file. I can say create a new file. Now I would like to create a file in the directory called maybe project. And in here, I have a project report. I call this also project.md. Note that I've write everything lowercase. That's really important because otherwise we will not find your uh, document and we will not read this. And um, in here we can define our markdown document. This would be a headline. Um, in case you want to have a bulleted list, this is a bullet. In case you want to have a numbered list, this is a number. In case uh, you want to have subsections, you do numbered lists. Um, or here maybe bullet list. And when I save this now, you need to scroll down here and uh, add a reasonable commit message, example, 
um, project report. And then you need to commit this uh, particular document. And here it's now committed. And if you want to look at it, you can just click on it and it will be rendered in your GitHub. As you can see, this is I've made a mistake here. I've made that mistake on purpose to show you that you need to be very careful with the syntax of Markdown to have it rendered properly. So you go back in here and you, you add the space in here. So you can see even GitHub uh, highlights this differently, right? So you can actually see this and then you can commit the change. Now it's properly rendered. So it couldn't be simpler than that. But one of the things that we um, have done is, is, is we have put, uh, pushed out to the class a document that uh, describes scientific writing with Markdown. Uh, this includes a couple of chapters. Uh, one of the most important one is actually um, plagiarism and how to avoid plagiarism. So you may want to do that. And you're welcome to take the course at IU uh, that uh, helps you evaluating if you um, understand plagiarism. And as you know, any class in IU requires you to understand plagiarism before you take this class. So this is really important. This is not part of this class. This is just simply part of how IU operates. And then there is a section here that explains you how Markdown works and what the syntax is. And instead of preparing any slides, I, I thought, well, you know, let me go in here in this document so that you can see what the Markdown is. And you can see is, is, is I have done the same thing here. Heading, subsections, bulleted list, links to, um, uh, to documents on the web, code with uh, three quotes, uh, Python uh, code that can be uh, added. And then here is uh, an image with a caption. One thing is this, um, you need to be using footnotes for, um, or I recommend for this class to simply just use footnotes for uh, citations. And it's important when you, for example, copy an image from the internet, that there is a footnote in the caption that you are, that you're doing. Um, if that's um, an issue, you can talk to the TAs about that. So, so when you, um, sorry, um, and then here's uh, some, uh, some other, um, other mechanisms. Important is when you're using hyperlinks without a caption, uh, you must put them into square brackets. That's something that's often overlooked. There's a whole bunch of FAQs in this, in this document, including which editors you can choose and what converters are out there that, that um, explain this to you. And um, uh, I recommend that you look at this. There is even a checklist at the end of this document um, to verify, you know, have you, uh, um, have you done all the checks for this? It's not required that you use BibTeX for this class, but uh, you can use uh, certainly BibTeX and JARPREF and then simply pass and copy what uh, JARPREF um, prints out as a format in the uh, display window into your document. That seems like the easiest for now um, so that we can organize this. The nice thing is, is, is once you do this and you have everything here, not only you can see this, but essentially the entire world, that means including your classmates and your classmates are welcome to look at the, your re reports and if they see something that is not correct or so, they can communicate with you to, for example, GitHub issues there you can, for example, um, formulate an issue here, simply say, um, 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 Gregor tested your repo. <coughs> this is just a test. And um, you can submit this and you can even assign this to uh, the person um, to be handled. In this case, it's, it's me. And I submit this new issue. And this way you can even communicate and comment to other people. When you do this, just be very gentle. Remember, this is a friendly environment. This is not something uh, uh, you, know, you should not write. Oh, this is all stupid what you write. Just, just do a very friendly tone when you're 
when you're utilizing this feature. As you can see, there is now an issue here. And this issue has been assigned. Once you, um, once you resolve the issue, you can even uh, close that issue and then it doesn't show up anymore um, when I do now a refresh. Um, there are many other editors out there that you can utilize. Um, one of these editors is, uh, for example, PyCharm. Those with advanced programming knowledge uh, may have uh, PyCharm already installed. And all the documentation that we have is um, uh, written either in PyCharm or in Emacs uh, originally. That's not through the GUI. But you can commit your things to, the, uh, to, uh, to GitHub via the command line tool or simply pass and copy via the uh, GUI. I would recommend if you're using an on offline editor to invest the time to figure out how, to, how do you commit in, in, into that repository. There's a video already in the class that demonstrates this for the class website itself. Naturally, if you choose not the class website, but your own repository, you can do it with that. If there's any questions about this, ask the TAs. They will be able to shoot specific videos for this class and to, uh, uh, to walk you through, for example, a, a change in, in, uh, in the report. Uh, uh, and as you can see, this is, this is essentially the format that you just saw in the EPUB that, that we have out. Um, and as you see here, it's even a spelling error that we should probably correct, there's an HTTP missing. Um, so I just didn't notice this till basically now. Um, and as you can see, this is, there's lots of information about how do, how, do, how do you write a document. In case you don't want to use an installed editor, you can use a tool such as Dillinger. They are also referred to in that particular uh, uh, markdown book. And as you can see, this is, I can type in here a line and say, hello, and as you see on the left-hand side, I write. On the right-hand side, uh, I get in real time an update um, how this is being rendered. So here you have how this looks like, and here is the rendered form. There are many different other editors here. Stack Edit is another uh, one of those. You can do the same thing. As you can see, this is all nice. And um, you just use the syntax. Um, you can, uh, Jeffrey pointed out some of the converters. We have not tested any of these converters. Um, so if you use them, uh, that's up to you. I feel like uh, the tools that you have available here are just sufficient. I know that if you export um, a Word, or there's a tool called Pandoc that converts also Word and Google Docs document to Markdown. If you apply that tool, because the way uh, Word uh, and um, Google Docs export their documents, they are full with unnecessary um, metadata. And that metadata will provide Pandoc with issues when you convert it. So it's just simply better if you use Word or Pandoc to just use it like you would use an online editor to use the um, Markdown uh, uh, um, tags that you essentially have with, within these um, documents instead of uh, using a fancy headline or something like this. So just, just write it like you would do this in this Markdown online editor. So naturally, you can uh, use Google and um, um, find out you know, what are the best editors that you can find. And um, in reality, the best editor that I have come across is actually Emacs. So if I created um, a, a markdown file, uh, uh, it automatically switches in into uh, the markdown mode. Um, so I can, I can write something like this and um, it highlights this uh, kind of nicely. And if you do a bullet, it comes in there. So the other thing that you have is, is, is when you write a really long text, sometimes it goes over these lines like this, but there you can say escape Q and uh, um, um, you can 
switch this to text mode and then simply say escape Q. Well, in this case, it doesn't actually work. Oh, it's the, uh, oh, uh, I rendered uh, this uh, wrong. So, so if, you, if you write here, it automatically breaks over in and into the new uh, line. Um, so Emacs is by far the best editor for Markdown. Um, uh, then PyCharm is really good if you do something local. Uh, then um, you can use Word. And if you use this format in Word, then this will work very well also in Word. Word has some special characters that don't translate very well uh, into Markdown, such as uh, quotes and uh, bullet points. So just make sure that you look over this document and fix them. Um, if you don't have an editor, just use a GitHub um, and uh, put the stuff in GitHub and, and use, um, uh, use it there. So this um, is essentially what needs to be said about Markdown. And um, if there are any questions on this, please don't hesitate to ask them on Piazza. And I would like to give back to Jeffrey if there's no other questions or other remarks. You need to stop sharing. Oh. All right, there's a chat question. All right, one of the students doesn't have a GitHub invitation. I'll be sure to get them that later. Uh, please send now in uh, during the class an email via Piazza or a post to Piazza to instructors with your github.com account. If, uh, um, if I have set up that account, you have an invitation in your email box that may be in the spam mail, but um, double check um, on, on this. You can also use the chat window here in um, in Zoom, and I will be immediately um, double checking that. So that once the class is over, you can hang out here with me and um, we can verify if this is uh, all resolved. I, and I don't see that chat because it's not a public no, it's a one. private one to me. I, had to, I asked the student to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So the homework this week um, will be getting ready for the project. <coughs> and the videos will therefore not have a homework on them. The videos will be on sports informatics and I will just review, I will just review that. Um, are there any more questions on the first part of the class? All right. All right, so um, this is just a summary of the module on sports informatics. It's a little old, this module, but um, uh, it is a pretty interesting area. And I have not come across drastic changes in this field. So, there is little doubt if you just follow sports um, news that, uh, that uh, there is a lot of data analytics in sports today. And that has been true for some time. And we will, if you start, if you look at the field, at least, I think it's probably still, uh, baseball is the 
sports which has the most analytics associated with it. And there is a reason for that. If you look at the game of baseball, it is, uh, I apologize for international students who may not be that familiar with it, but it, it is all involves individuals. Namely, if you look at, I don't know, a game of soccer, soccer is pretty complicated. Any, any sort of play in soccer involves multiple players um, sending the ball to each other and interacting with each other. Whereas in baseball, it's a little different. The pitcher throws the ball, the batter receives the ball, the batter tries to hit the ball, the fielder tries to field the ball, and so on. And so they, they can be looked at pretty uh, individually, whereas that's certainly not true in American football or soccer, where the actual plays are very complex. So I think much more progress has been made in baseball. So we will start, we, this, whole, this whole study starts with baseball. Um, and there is, there was a movie called Moneyball, which was uh, described as, uh, and, uh, actually, a, pretty old now, almost 18 years ago, uh, how data analytics was used by Oakland to, to win the uh, championship. And um, one of the interesting parts of base about baseball is also you can actually make a good economic analysis because uh, winning a game has a very clear monetary value. And so, um, and this is another example of where uh, the, these monetary values, several million dollars a game, means that you can spend a lot of money on, on computer science and data analytics or data science. All right, so here's the introduction. Those other uh, pages were just um, the hierarchical description of the, of the subject. This is divided into three uh, units, which are slide decks, and each of those slide decks has um, around four to six uh, lessons in it. So if you look at um, how this data analytics is done, there are maybe three or four just very distinct ways it is um, it is it is uh, it is set up. Namely, baseball is mainly is uh, uh, historically done on the statistics of the game, the number of balls pitched, the number of times the batter hits, and things like that. There's another set of analyses, which is just analysis of real-time video. Nowadays, you can video record everything. And so every hit and every pitch, or actually every kick in the soccer game can be recorded on video and analyzed. Another general approach is you just <coughs> cover people in census. Remember, we live in the world of the Internet of Things. And so you can have position sensitive tags on every player and use that to monitor the players and put that monitored position information into some analysis. And there are also other custom instruments you can use of that type. Uh, there is this uh, sports analytics conference at MIT and there is a Society for American Baseball uh, Research, which uh, has both a conference and a lot of data on their website. Well, I've already made this point. We have these three types of uh, data sources. And again, another actual feature and problem in this area, this data is not available except the baseball. I think most of the numeric data, the statistics, they're in the public domain. But none of the videos and none of the sensor data is in the public domain. And so 
Uh, and I doubt if they're going to be put in the public domain. This is all too valuable and there's too much money locked up in it. Um, and you can use this information both to, in the case, say in the case of baseball, your, your team X and your playing team Y, you can use data analytics to decide which are the best players to put on your team because you can choose a different team for each game. And as you know, the top players on the uh, opponent's team, you can uh, possibly change your lineup in an effective fashion. And you can use data analytics to just do a probabilistic analysis of which are the best players to play. Again, I don't think this is nearly as um, clear as in some other sports. Again, in soccer or American football, I don't think it's so individual. Well, there are certainly key players like quarterbacks and and uh, and receivers in in American football, but it is not nearly as. Uh, and you could, and I don't think there's quite the same correlations. Whereas in baseball, there's huge correlations because you have left-handed hitters and right-handed hitters, and depending on whether the pitcher is right-handed or left-handed, or whether they throw fastballs or knuckleballs and things. There's a lot of pretty specialized information you can use in optimizations. Um, the other thing we'll see at the end is there is quite a lot of uh, visualization data, and that is broadly used, but it's not nearly as quantitative because it just gives you pictures of um, what's going on. All right, so this has got this fancy name which comes from SABR, the Society of uh, American Baseball Research, and so they had, they've they, they're responsible for sabermetrics, which is this study of baseball based on their statistics. And um, we will see uh, how they try to quantify the analysis. As you will see, I sort of call this little data because this is not huge amounts of data. Uh, it will not require a giant petabytes of data to record the statistics. It might require petabytes of data to record the videos, but I, I, the videos, I, I'm not aware of a, of a clear description of how the videos can be used easily. And we will discuss the concept of a replacement player. And here is this um, uh, movie Moneyball, which describes the Oakland Athletics, who had one of the lowest paid teams, $40 million. Notice the New York Yankees paid that team $120 million in 2002 uh, a year. And Oakland Athletics were a factor of three lower. But by being clever with data analytics, they were able to uh, finish first in their division. And there's this fellow, Vince Gennario, who uh, writes, uh, has a very good book. I recommend reading his book. And he has, he has presentations. He's at, the, at least he used to be at the University of Columbia, Columbia University. And um, he uh, has a very good description of baseball as a business because this is all folded in. I mean, they, remember in um, everything when we're doing optimization, well, the optimization here in, in baseball is quite clear. It's dollars. You want to maximize the money you get from a season's play. And you have to, because you have to, uh, you have the money you bring in, which is both the attendance of the games and TV rights or web rights. And you have to subtract the money you spend to your players. Um, so, and there are some teams I, which have very different goals and they also have different um, ratios of the, um, of the amount of money they get from um, fans coming to the games and coming to TV. And if you're in the Yankees in a very large market like New York City, then you'd have a different char different characteristics, say from uh, 
a, a team in Tampa or, or, or Minneapolis, which have a much smaller local local support. And as we will see later, in baseball, like in most sports, there is a lot of action at the end of the season because you have a playoff at the end of the season to determine who's number one. And um, those games at the end of the season are worth a lot of money because they're actually nationally very visible. And so if you get into the playoffs, it's worth money. So that's sort of interesting. That is folded into your decisions. Um, so here's actually the previously we had a chart which was money out, which is the money they spent on their players. Here, that was, that was in 2002. Here we in 2013 have the revenue, the money in, which is actually, if you remember New York Yankees were on the right because they actually split, split, uh, where they, they uh, um, paid their players the most well, they also get the most money due to their lucrative uh, TV deals and strong home market. And again, uh, there's quite a variation. There's factors of three variation in both these plots. And uh, again, this is why it's a shame this is a bit out of date. It'd be good to update this plot. Although it's, this plot obviously will be destroyed this year due to the pandemic. Um, and this shows the yearly attendance going up for major, uh, major League Baseball. Of course, they'll be down this year, but here is this uh, um, magic number of $5 million. Namely, if you play a game that to, which will decide whether or not you get into the playoffs, that game is, winning that game is worth $5 million. So it's worth putting a lot of effort into winning it. Um, and you also hear, the, this is all folded into how ingeniously you've um, manipulated and owned the various media rights and things like that. And whether you've persuaded your um, local community to buy you a new stadium or not. Um, so a player is measured by the so-called WAR for the player, which is the wins above replacement. A replacement player is just a random replacement player with a certain performance. And then you uh, look at um, how, my, how, my, how better a given player is than this, this and it's not actually an average, but he's a below average player. The one you can easily get to replace a injured player. Um, so obviously a player's value to a team depends on exactly how he fits the team's um, capabilities and um, and uh, there's a, right here is a number which appears elsewhere that a win, winning a game is roughly the same as uh, scoring 10 runs. But um, you can so this um, sports informatics not only looks at the um, chance of winning a game, it also tries to quantify that in dollars. Because that, that's, those dollars are what actually decide what you do. All right, so here we come to these basic metrics. And there are endless metrics and there are more done in the detailed modules I just put in um, a few here. If you go to the Wikipedia page, uh, there are multiple pages on baseball. One of them is called Baseball Statistics. And you will find 41 different statistics for batting, which are just to um, various linear combinations of how often the, the batter hits the ball, how often he's hit by the pitch, how often he runs for more for how many bases he runs per pitch and thing how many home runs things like that there are seven statistics for the measure the base running capable how you can run from base to base 50 for pitching the one that's most famous because uh, even i who don't play baseball know about is home run average um 
just the number of runs scored per, per out. Um, 12 for fielding, three for overall, which is the things like wins above replacement, and four for general concepts. Um, and you have to, you, you have a lot of art artistry about which of these statistics you use. And I say, I don't think you could call any of these big data because these, they're all just statistics recording each of the games. There are actually a lot of games in baseball. I think they play around 160 for a team in a season. And you record information about every pitch and every at-bat. And uh, how many? We probably have uh, 27 at-bats per team, or well, at least 27 uh, at-bats plus three times nine. You have nine, three outs and nine innings. And of course, if you score a run, that's not uh, that you, you, that's not an out. So there's at least 27 at bats. Uh, that would be a, if there were no hits. If there hits, you'll get more at bats. And every batter has to is, is like every every uh, at bat would probably have I don't know what the average number of pitches is. Again, it's probably about three pitches per per person because you're. Uh, you're, you're only allowed a certain number of pitches, and those pitches have to be uh, not not uh, bad bad pitches. Um, so you have basic statistics such as earned run average, and then you have these sophisticated. Um, um, uh, Sophisticated uh, statistics like sabermetrics, which are like wins above replacement, is basically a giant linear combination of simple statistics. Then we will see that these technologies, which are these video technology, of which pitch FX is one of these video technologies, and that is big data. All right. So what this says is that uh, at the time I wrote this, which was unfortunately five years ago, these big data technologies were only just coming into play. Um, and of course the videos themselves are actually can be summarized. I mean, you can take the video of the pitch and summarize it by, well, based on this video, this pitch was of the following type it had the following movement of the ball because you you'd have to throw and the following speed of the ball so the video can be reduced cannot does not have to be viewed as a video it can be viewed as a way of calculating some more simple little data now if i use video to try to analyze a soccer game i don't think that's going to work you can't so easily summarize it by individual numbers that's why i say i keep pointing out the baseball is a significantly easier than other games. And uh, <clears throat> there is an interesting application of what is in a recommender engine, the way Netflix and Amazon give you advice as to what to buy. I will describe that later on. And I've already told you this. Baseball has very clean data. Because baseball has been obsessed with statistics from the beginning. Uh, there are statistics, say in basketball, you always, would, when you look at the um, performance of the Indiana University basketball team, or actually any team, the Pacers or Lakers or what have you, you will find that they will tell you what their percentage on throwing free throws is, or what the how many three-pointers they threw, and what, what the percentage was. And um, so there are these sort of cosmic averages associated with all gains, but they don't, so they're not quite so easy to translate into, into decisions. So here I just give, I forget what I have, one or two examples here of complicated statistics. So here is OPS, which is a sabermetric statistics. 
and it sums up OBP, which is on base percentage, and SLG, which is slugging average. And uh, they just measure different features. They, uh, they're all calculated based on these other simpler number of hits, number of base on balls, times hit by the pitch, number of at-bats, number of sacrifice flies, which are where you hit the ball high in the air so that the base runner can advance, but you get out. And TB, so it's still an important type of hit. It's just you don't get direct credit because you, um, you're actually out. So this is, says, of course, these uh, statistics are slightly non-trivial. You have to know a little bit about the game to design these statistics. Here is the second one, which is this much more um, well-known one, because it's typically given for every, uh, every pitcher. And when you, they're described, they usually list their ERA, on run average. And you just, and an earned run means you take the runs scored by against the pitcher and subtract off the ones which are due to screw ups by the fielders and other mistakes, which are not the fault of the pitcher. So an earned run is the runs which are, can be directly attributed to the pitcher throwing a ball, which the, uh, which the other team managed to exploit to get runs or advanced bases. And there's some amusing comments here about, um, say, the, the fact that baseball depends on where you are. I mean, if you're in the Colorado, in Denver, as you're at a 5,000 foot uh, elevation, that actually makes the, the baseball behave differently. So it actually um, travels more easily through the through the air because it's very arid and um, possibly it's presumably lower pressure. And um, that means that when the batter had with a given force hits the ball, it will just go further in Denver. And that means the poor old pitcher will have more runs scored against, <coughs> against them. And you have to, so you have to put that into your analysis because if you just took the ERA for a pitcher in Denver, they're bound to be worse than for a pitcher in Yang in New York City. And I gather also that actually Denver better be careful about which type of pitcher they they have because it's hard to throw these subtle breaking balls because they don't break as well in Denver due to the reduced air resistance and the and I gather you can't even hold the ball as well. So there are lots of subtleties here. And here we have a quick discussion about wins above replacement. Um, and this is, this is a, presumably uh, sort of one of the way uh, people decide who to hire, how much money to pay them. And when you're doing these difficult uh, and very important decisions about uh, what the team you put together for, say, um, either to get into the playoffs or if you're in the playoffs, to win the playoffs. And um, you uh, characterize a person by how much better they are than this so-called replacement player. And... So historically, probably a replacement player is actually a pretty is a below average player, namely either uh, um, so they have uh, the an average player, the, you know, the person who's paid a lot of money to play in baseball because baseball salaries are pretty high. They would have a wins above replacement of two point oh five. And that means they would actually tend to score 20 more, 20 more, 20.5 five more runs over 600 plaint appearances than the, than the so-called replacement player. And you can look at wins above replacement for different, for the whole team, parts of teams. And you have to bear in mind that the WAR is, is actually dependent on your playing time. If you don't play, you can't actually 
get any wins, so you can't actually have a wins above replacement. Remember, the standard WAR corresponds to 600, 600 at bats. Um, and I say, if you happen to have a team with replacement level people, it would only win less, less than 30, but just little less than 30% of, um, of the games it played, which is, means you would do very miserably. And um, so, and there are various discussions here about um, the way they change the definition of replacement level. And here is a little, I mean, here's a sort of obvious, um, nice graph at the bottom about people's ability. I will be on the far left. Um, and then you have some sort of um, capability at baseball. And then the people who play in the majors are up here in the, in the um, tail of the incredibly good, the people who play in the minor leagues are not as good. And the replacement level is sitting here. And remember, the uh, typical average player is sitting here above the replacement level. And um, for obvious reasons, you have to be in the far right to be able to play in a national team. And this points out here that the average players are actually not so many of them because uh, you have to be pretty good to be an average player. Because well, this is average of players who play in the league. Um, and it just points out that uh, there are the, the wins above replacement will be different for pitchers and different for batters and <coughs> different for catchers. And they just sum up again lots of these small statistics. So there are another one like the uh, one which added the slugging in the on base percentage. Here we just have six things added up for a particular, this particular definition of WAR. And whereas wins above replacement are well defined, the formula for calculating it is not well defined. And different, uh, different people will have different things. But it's the type of thing. This is how your data analytics is set up. You're trying to decide, and this is obviously important, you need to try to quantify uh, how good a particular team is. Um, <clears throat> and here it says, here's a discussion of the wins above replacement um, for um, um, pictures, and we have to use this so-called FIP which means you remove the screw-ups of the fielders. Um, and um, there are also, and then there are points out you have to uh, fold in how good a particular team is in fielding, and also the nature of the ballpark. I pointed out Denver is different from New York. And you also have to look at the different types of pitchers. There are some pitchers who start the game, starters, they tend to run about six innings um, or maybe more. And then you have the relief pitchers who come in for the last innings or two. And they are really, uh, they have a very tense situation. They're not, <coughs> they need to just throw a few incredibly good pitches. Whereas a starting pitcher has to throw quite a few, more, many more very good pitches, but not necessarily super good. And relievers should have better ERA because they don't pitch as much. And so they can really pour energy into wonderful pitches. And uh, obviously uh, relievers are particularly important in close games. When you come in as a reliever and your team is six runs ahead, well, you don't have so much pressure than if you um, come in as a relief pitcher, the bases are loaded and the score is even or something. So that's when these relief pitchers get their value. And All right, so here we have a few comments on these more um, sophisticated technologies using video. And 
here I do that for a rather simple case of the, which I found interesting because it uses recommender engines. And this was introduced by this fellow from Colombia, Vince Genario. And they were, they basically um, characterize pictures. So they effectively associated with ever, every picture, a vector, or in this case of length 12, which were uh, measures of the type of pictures they threw. Like the top two pitches, um, I don't know, sliders and fastballs or something. And uh, how, what the variety was, what the location was, how, and if you're a fastball, how fast is it? There are quite a lot of differences there. And, but if also, if you're a good pitcher, you'll be able to move the ball and as, you, as it uh, gets towards the batter. And obviously, uh, the more the movement, uh, possibly, presumably the harder it is to hit. And um, uh, the time I say that, and if you have two pitches, you might vary about how, how, how you put them together. All right. So those are your your twelve component vector. And then, um, then you just uh, take the data. And you have to separate it into groups because I pointed out that uh, baseball is particularly sensitive to left-handed and right-handed. I believe baseball is a game where left-handed people are actually having a slight advantage. And because uh, there are not so many left-handed people and yet uh, they're particularly affected against right-handed, uh, left-handed pitchers are effective against right-handed uh, batters. Um, and you have to, then this points out, well, you know, when you're doing these types of analyses, you're in your, in this crucial game, which will decide whether you go to the playoffs. When you choose your pitchers, you need to know what the opponent's players are. Are they right-handed or left-handed and et cetera. So this is why this type of a very detailed analysis is useful. Um, and you essentially, this is the um, this basic problem. You have a batter pitcher matchup, and then when you know, when you're in the last innings, uh, um, you're allowed to swap players, and so uh, you know you you need one hit to win the game. So you bring in a particular new player, and you bring in that player because they have a good record, or you think they will have a good record against the current pitcher. And then often the alternative team, the, uh, the team which is fielding and pitching <coughs> will bring in a new pitcher because they think that pitcher will do better against the bat you just brought up. And then you can retire your batter and so on. So this is all, uh, this says that I pointed out that baseball is sort of interesting because there's these very precise point analyses. And here we have batter versus pitcher analysis. Um, and so what Gennarie pointed out is that you can actually uh, divide pitchers into groups which have similar characteristics. And whereas you may, you know, sorry, so here we have Fred is, uh, is pitching and Jim is batting and maybe Fred and Jim have never faced each other before. But if Jim has a similar characteristics to Harry, you can look how Fred performed against Harry. And, suggest, and that suggests that it would be similar. So this is why clustering is interesting, because you can increase uh, dramatically uh, the uh, amount of information you have, because you will have common groups of people. So you can analyze groups of batters versus groups of pitchers. And um, well, that's what this, I, this stage, I had to find this on the web. This is a YouTube about how to do this. And this is a quite nifty technology at the time. Uh, Yark Data is a graph and a graph analysis engine. And um, say the pictures, are, uh, uh, they, you take these 12 dimensional vectors and you just look which vectors are near each other in the 12 dimensional space. And you get some diagram like this 
of where um, our pictures are, are linked to each other and uh, plotted in this, mapped into this uh, graph space. And you can see that um, there's quite a lot of structure there. There are clear clusters which are very well separated. And um, this was left-handed pictures uh, pitching to right-handed batters. So as you pointed out, you have to do the four cases of each hand for the pitcher and each hand for the batter separately because they're really quite different. Um, and you can see some um, isolated clusters because there's some pitchers like um, who throw so-called knuckleballs, which are, which I, I used to when I, I played cricket, not uh, baseball, and I used to throw uh, ball googlies, which are sort of similar concept of a very peculiar spinning uh, ball. So. There are special pitches which are sort of can't where they where they cluster together because knuckleball pitches tend to look similar. And then of course you try to look at the performance of a batter against all, all the all possible knuckleball pitches if the opponent is going to bring up such a pitcher against you. All right, so there's more detail of that in the module. All right, so we need the, the last is all about pitches. The, uh, we're now moving to a section where the only real information we have, we, we, we finished the discussion of um, detailed statistics, which is this uh, sabermetrics. And uh, here is just, uh, we will go through quite quickly, uh, is uh, just a set of pictures of, um, of uh, videos of uh, first baseball and then other other sports. Um, so here you have a video on the right you have this video of somebody running to catch the ball and um, on the on the, um, uh, the middle which is called left is really the middle of this particular slide is the type of material that's available and this is done better here. Here you have this fielder, and this comes from one of these videos. Uh, Jason Hayward is running and manages to catch the ball. And you see what they've recorded. This video is recorded uh, the actual distance between where T Jason started and where he ended, and the actual distance he ran, 83 feet instead of 80.81. Presumably he didn't necessarily judge the landing position quite correctly. Anyway, he got, he didn't do badly. And here is, um, well, here is actually the start of this, where you have the ball going in the middle in between these two, um, uh, two uh, fielders. And you can see Reed Johnson is 83 feet away. And uh, Jason Haywood, who actually got the ball, as we saw, is 81 feet away. And we have a record of the, uh, the he, he, Jason runs faster. 18.5 miles per hour and better acceleration. So he's a, he is the one who actually, well, he was actually nearer, but he also um, <clears throat> did get the ball. And you can also see at the front of the picture, the runners advancing is, uh, on this uh, fly ball. Now there's a whole section in the module on wearables. I'm going to skip that here because uh, there is um, the health and medicine module of this class will do a lot more on wearables. Uh, then we had some uh, little discussion of some of the uh, other sports uh, and uh, first with soccer and, uh, and Olympics. And um, one of the, this is an illustration of uh, the use of tracking devices. And there are, um, you can put sensors in your, in this case here, uh, footballs. And uh, you can also uh, put GPS trackers on your players. I remember, I mean, I remember I even, I was at Syracuse University once and I remember discussing this right down when I was first there, which must have been 1991, um, about doing that because Syracuse was, quite keen on football and basketball. So trackers are an obvious idea and um, they have been 
used somewhat. I don't think that, because the trouble is you have to persuade everybody to use them. And uh, they also, also pr probably putting them in the ball uh, requires agreement from the, from the sports. Um, here is one from Adidas, which has, um, which is an internet of things, uh, type trackers to measure the, the performance and the health status of the players. Here is the last set of visualizations in football and basketball that these visualizations finish this summary. Um, and here's the type of information you can get. Uh, here you have a football field um, where the, the uh, goalposts are at the bottom and they move up. And here is just a plot of the percentage of completions when the quarterback throws it successfully to a receiver. And then we have the size of the blob is the number of such, um, such, um, such uh, throws. And then the color represents the percentage of completion percentage with red as being very high. Here's a similar um, one from the National Football League. So these are just statistics which probably can, which uh, can either again can be done of course separately for each quarterback or each team, and they basically be used probably to to make decisions about when to do various things, when to run, when to um, throw. Notice, unlike so soccer, is a pretty dynamic game. You don't stop and think. In American football, is full of stops where you can think. So there's a lot of, there's probably more opportunity in American football to feed in information, uh, data analytics. <coughs> Here's another plot of a similar type of um, pointing out that um, Here's the line of scrimmage at the bottom, which is where the, uh, the teams are located either side of. And you can see that uh, most throws go uh, less than 10, actually an average of about four yards. And of course you can then run after you catch it, but um, that's the length of the throw. And they're just not so many. And the ones which are actually long, sort of interesting, they're at the side, because we have, if we go to, more than 20 yards, that's 3.6 on 4.2 for the left and right, but only 1% down the middle. So that's sort of, a, these are sort of interesting statistics which allow you to place your defensive team and things like that. Um, so there is just some, some pointers or discussions about how you use video to make decisions. But notice it's far more complex than anything we had in, in baseball. Because the, remember we have all these players here. We look here at these videos, they've actually identified players. So this is not, not one on one. Even in baseball, the most complex case we had was two fielders running for the same ball. But effectively that's one on one. One, you can treat each fielder separately. Uh, in NBA, that's full of shooting information. That's the last, inf last thing in, the, in these slides. And um, you can just obviously catalog as a function of position on the, in the, in the, in the uh, court, how, what the percentage of success is. And it varies quite a lot, as you see here. This is a, I gather, Jose Corderon is a rather, one of the better shooters. Now here is a, here's a shooter with a pretty different percentage. He's 58.5 on the, on the edge on the left, 42 edge on the right, and only 38 from the middle at the top. So that's quite a big variation. Uh, here is somebody who's not quite so good. And he's no, he's much lower for these uh, long range shots on the, uh, than the previous player. Here we have a very famous player, LeBron James. 
and his numbers are much higher. And he's particularly good at dunks next to the basketball net. And here is five year, some sort of a some sort of plot about field goals, about where, where they're taken from. So it's actually quite striking structure about where shots are taken from. They're not uniform. And here's a similar plot um, from the same, which are the which measure <coughs> here the color tells you the average number of points per shot. So it's very high in the three-point range uh, at the at the edge, and very high for the dunks, which are sure things if you get the dunk in right. And uh, this is summarized here, and I got it out of this particular conference. All right, so that uh, finishes this particular, um, I think it does, yes. Oh no, here's a couple on tennis, sorry, I forgot that. All right, we have a minute or two. Tennis, you can plot the locations of shots. Here's Federer versus Andy Murray. Um, and you can, uh, call, you can, you can uh, plot where people hit. But again, how that translates into success, you can get nice pictures, which maybe help you in training players, but it's not nearly so easy to translate into a success. Um, is, here is um, another one such, uh, such data. And as far as I know, this data is not available. You cannot get this data. And here is um, horse racing, where tracking devices are an obvious thing to use. And that really is the end. All right. So any questions? So I, I, this, is, uh, this module, hey, we have 17 chats. Hopefully those are all Gregor interacting with the class. Looks like it. Okay, so hopefully we fixed a lot of problems. Yeah, if there's anybody still having issues, uh, I am online um, and probably Jeffrey will stop the recording, uh, but I will be online for a while, okay? So, and then I can uh, talk to you through Zoom uh, about your issues, okay? I'll keep the Zoom on until 11 o'clock and because I have another meeting at 11. Just make sure you switch off the recording though. Yeah, I will.